So the question we have now is if input is so important, what does traditional practice do? What does that change the following sentences to inversion? Est-ce que vous parlez français? Parlez-vous français? What does that kind of practice do? And your answer is what? Nothing. Essentially, not much. Very little, if anything. In fact, there are some people who argue much more strongly than I that say, it does nothing, right? Um, it does not help with mental representation. It is not clear that it helps with skill development, which we're going to touch on in just a minute. So if we have our practice makes perfect m mindset, what we want to do is kind of go, no, not really. That's really not how language develops. Okay, we're about to go into point three, so it's a good point for a question. Good for you. But there's no but. We'd be asking students to practice so that they know what to do when you assess, and so that we can use that data to direct well, our instruction. What you're saying, let me let me just peel that back for a minute. That there there should be some relationship between what's going on in class and how things are tested. There's sort of something implied there, right? Right. right. Um, so my answer to that is change your testing. Mm -hmm. Change your assessment. Yeah. But don't, shouldn't they at least be used to doing that format? Yeah, so change your assessment, and then you can do in class what you need to do. OK, um, so let's go on to point three. We've got about uh, 15, 20, 10 or 15 minutes left, and we should have just enough time to cover this before we take a break, unless you don't want to take a break. OK, communication is distinct from mental representation. Okay, let's begin with the definition. I want you to, this has to go really fast because we're running out of time here. So, um, with somebody next to you, I want you to define communication. So, answer, or finish the sentence. Com communication is what? I'll give you one minute. Go. Okay, who has the definition of communication? Quick, don't be shy. I'm not going to call on Ryan because he's the king. So. Okay, we have sharing ideas. What else? Conveying meaning, what else? Interaction. Interaction, what else? Making yourself understood, what else? Expression, Expression. what else? Successful understanding between people. Successful understanding between people, okay. You all have bits and pieces of the technical definition of communication I want you to have. So now we're going to take your ideas and put them together in this definition. That communication is the expression, interpretation, and negotiation of meaning in a given context. Okay, so let's break this down. Let's break it down. Come on, break it down. Okay, meaning is information, propositional content, or intent. What is it that you want to say, or what is the person saying to me? Expression is your production. Interpretation is your comprehension. Nego uh, context is the participants and the setting or purpose. Those are very important to communication because communication shifts and adjusts itself depending on context. And negotiation means sometimes communication is not successful. What is being expressed is not necessarily what's being interpreted by the other person, so there has to be clarification, confirmation, and co-construction of the discourse. That just means that both of them work together to make sure that they understand what they're saying. Okay. Now, how is communication context dependent? And here's where pragmatics come in, for those of you who are one of, okay, so here's this guy Jake, this fictitious kid Jake, 19 year old at MSU campus, talking with his best friend at lunch. And Jake says, hey, here's a question only you can answer. And his friend says, shoot. <laughs> we all understand what's going on there, right? Now, Jake is in a political science class now. He raises his hand, he says, professor, he says, first he says, excuse me, because he's polite. He's been on Judge Judy and she's read him the act. So he knows to say excuse me first. Professor, I have a question. And the professor says, go ahead, Jake. And this is uh, with his romantic partner. They're watching a DVD at home. And Jake leans in and says, I have to ask you something. And the person says, hmm? In each and every one of these situations, Jake is performing the exact same pragmatic intent. In one context, he says, here's a question only you can answer. And excuse me, professor, I have a question. And then in the third, I have to ask you something. Those are three very distinct ways to say, I have a question. <laughs> and it changes depending on the context, the context being the setting or the partner uh, and the people, the physical setting and the people.
Okay, why is that important? Because people have social roles, expectations, and so on. An important point to note is that although context influences how people use language to communicate, context does not influence the nature of language itself. What this means is that Spanish is always Spanish no matter where it's spoken. French is always French no matter where it's spoken. So let's go back to look at English, for example, um, and examples with Jake from the previous slide. The syntax of English will always be the syntax of English no matter who Jake communicates with. So, for example, Jake does not switch from a subject-verb-object language to a subject-object-verb language depending on context. English is always a subject-verb-object language. Jake does not switch from an inflectionally weak English to an inflectionally strong English, which would be similar to Spanish or Italian, for example, depending on context. English is always going to be inflectionally weak. And Jake does not switch from English's 11 vowels to only 5 vowels depending on context. The English vowel system is the English vowel system no matter the, what context Jake is speaking in or any of us are speaking in. So the point here is that, it, is that mental representation does not change because of context. So communication then makes use of mental representation during language use. The question for us becomes how does this communication develop? How does it evolve over time? There's a fundamental principle here which is this, that communication develops only through acts of communication. What I mean by this is that learners learn to communicate by engaging in contextualized acts of, remember our definition, expression, interpretation, and negotiation of meaning in given contexts. Um, communication does not develop because of practice with language. You don't sit there and practice communication. Communication develops because you're communicating. In other words, what you have to engage in is what psychologists call transfer appropriate behavior. If you want to gain skill in something, if you want to learn how to do something, you have to, from the very beginning, engage in that behavior that you want to get skill in. You can't do something that's not like that and think that that skill, that what you're learning is going to transfer to the skill that you want to develop. No. The skill has to be transfer appropriate all the way along the line. What's important for teachers to note and instructors of languages is that classrooms are fixed contexts of communication. They're fixed. This is very important. What this means is that the setting is always the same. You're always in a classroom. It's always the same chairs, the same windows, the same four walls. The setting does not change. And more importantly, or just as important I should say, is that the participants are always the same. It's always the students and a teacher. In other words, the classroom is not a bank and the participants are not a bank teller and somebody who wants a transaction. The setting is not a doctor's office in which the participants are a doctor, a patient, and a nurse. Classrooms are classrooms with fixed setting and fixed participants. Uh, role playing and acting are often used by language teachers and I think what I want to impress upon people here is that role play and acting do not obviate the constraints on the classroom context. Role play and acting are not communicative in the sense that is used here. If we think of communication as expression, interpretation, and negotiation of meaning in a given context, and the context is fixed in the classroom with students and teachers, that means that communication has to be between students and teachers. You cannot role play and be a doctor and a patient because you aren't and you aren't negotiating, interpreting, or expressing real meaning, you're play acting. Um, those might be useful activities to do for other reasons. Um, they might be fun, they might be engaging, but we don't want to say that those can substitute for actual communicative activities as we've defined communication in the current context. An interesting thing from research is that the language that grows in your head, what we call mental representation, may grow during communicative interactions. Now why is that? Why would, why would your mental representation grow if communication involves processes different from that? Well that's because part of your interactions, part of your communicative interactions include interpretation of meaning. And there should be a clue there to you, a hint of why uh, mental representation might grow. That's because interpretation of meaning implies that you're being exposed to input as a learner. And if you're being exposed to input, that's input that you're interpreting for its meaning. So therefore, communicative interchanges contain input uh, that might be useful to the learner that helps the language system grow over time. Now, um, let's wrap up here and think about some of the things we've talked about in this first, uh, the, these first three sections uh, of our romp through second language acquisition. The first point we've tried to make is that learners create an abstract mental representation of language, similar to the way in which first language learners do.
In other words, what we're saying is that L1 and L2 acquisition have a lot of similarity. Even though we know they might not be exactly the same, they have a lot of similarity. And one place in which they're similar is that both sets of learners, L1 learners and L2 learners, have to create an abstract mental representation. This representation bears little to no resemblance to what is traditionally taught in practice. In other words, textbook rules aren't what winds up in your head. Um, and paradigms and, 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 and the kinds of things that you practice in typical language classes just aren't part of this representation. This representation builds up over time due to consistent and constant exposure to input data. That is, you've got to get immersed in a language for your representation to build up. Uh, no way around that. Importantly here, practice, as it is traditionally conceived and traditionally talked about, does little to foster the development of this presentation, or this, excuse me, this representation. So in other words, practice might engage you in language-like behaviors and some language-like knowledge, but practice, as traditionally conceived, does not get you language as we talk about it here. Another point we've made in this first section is that communication is about language use. And by what language we mean by language use is that we're talking about the expression, interpretation, and negotiation of meaning. At the same time, communication is context dependent. So how you express meaning, how you interpret meaning, and how you engage in some kind of negotiation of meaning is all dependent upon the context in which that communication is happening. As we saw from the examples of Jake with his, the way he asks questions in the classroom. Now communication assumes some kind of underlying representation. You can't communicate out of thin air. So presumably you have something in your head that you tap during your communication. Um, and finally, communication develops only by engaging in communication. You can't really practice communication in the traditional sense. So in other words, just like mental representation evolves over time based on your exposure to input, communication evolves and develops over time because you've been engaged in communication. Our final point in this wrap-up is a question for you. Sitting back and looking at what we talked about in terms of mental representation being distinct from uh, communication, the nature of communication, and the fact that there are severe limits on what practice does for language learners, uh, that is at least traditional practice, the question becomes what implications are there for language teaching so far? That's a question we'll leave for you to think about.